Hello and welcome to the recording of the Partners 2020 Ask the Experts Industry Webinar from Medicine. This session was hosted by our careers consultant Karen Pearson and she was joined by our guests, both Newcastle University alumni. First, Robert Wilson, who after a successful career as a consultant, surgeon and medical director, is now retired and amongst other things is currently enjoying his time as a playwright. And we're also joined by Dr Chris Johnson, who has a prolific career in medicine spanning over three different roles and amongst others is currently working as a military consultant in anaesthetics, intensive care medicine and pre-hospital emergency medicine. Each of these guests will be delivering short talks and presentations to tell you a little bit more about their time in university, study in medicine and their career to date. Karen will then lead our guests and some of the partner students who were able to tune in at the session live through a Q&A to help you gain further insight and information from our alumni guests. Without any further ado, we're going to hand over to Robert Wilson, who's going to tell you a little bit more about himself and his career in medicine. Uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, really good to see you here. I hope you're, um, you've been using your lockdown wisely. I'm sure you, I'm sure you have. <laughs> Um, it, it's, um, it's good to see you all and um, many thanks to the university for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, my name is Robert Wilson. Um, I was uh, born and brought up and educated in uh, Gateshead in um, a bit of the town called um, Deckham, believe it or not. And um, it um, has a reputation for being challenged and challenging. Um, and um, when I uh, applied uh, to come to medical school or when I decided I wanted to come to medical school, um, I was in a situation where um, no one in my family had been to university before and no one in my school had been to medical school. Um, and this was at a time when it was quite common to, for um, medical students to come from the families of, of other doctors and so on. Um, so uh, careers advice and so on at, at school was um, that that was going to be difficult. And you know how it is when someone tells you you can't do something, there's nothing quite as motivating to get on and uh, try to do it. So I persisted and it's a bit of a long story as to how I got in to medical school which I can enlarge on later if you want but um, anyway ev eventually I, I got there um, and um, I, after a, um, uh, a little bit of time feeling like a fish out of water when I started at um, medical school um, I eventually got into it and um, and got through the course um, without too much uh, difficulty and uh, qualified um, in medicine. Um, I'd always felt that what I really wanted to do was surgery. Um, and uh, from really my mid-teens, I think I knew that's what I wanted to do. And uh, as I went through the course, uh, that, that really just strengthened that feeling. So um, I joined the, the surgical training course, mainly in the, in the Northeast and went through that for a a period of years, um, remaining connected to the university and doing a, um, a research degree uh, in the middle of it. Um, the point of the training is to give you experience in a lot of different areas and see how a lot of different people do their, their job. Uh, but eventually I was appointed to a consultant post on, on T side, um, where I remained for a long time until I retired a few years ago. Um, so I was a consultant surgeon there, but I did a number of other jobs um, through that time to do with research and teaching and so on and so forth. And um, uh, eventually I was the, the medical director there, which is essentially like managerially anyway, the most senior doctor in the organization. So I did that for five years as well as the consultant job before I retired. And for a short while I was the... Um, deputy and the acting chief exec for for a while as well so anyway i retired a few years ago but i continue to work by giving pastoral support to clinical colleagues and so on 
and I work for a thing called the Faculty of Medical Leadership, which helps introduce science into, into leadership, really, and tries to convince people it's not all sort of fluffy stuff. Um, and as well as those things, I, I do the odd thing like this for the, for the university. So, you know, I've remained connected with the university um, really since I was, since I was 18. Um, I would say, um, you know, medicine is a challenging career. It can be hard work and it can be long hours and you do see things that, um, you know, ca can be um, challenging to see. But I, I guess I would say this, but if I, if I was starting again, uh, I'd, I'd want to do the same thing all over again. I, I am one of those people who would say, you know, at, at, at my end of my career, um, if I if I had my time over, I would do it again. Um, I think it does give you a real sense of purpose and a, achievement. It's probably better organised now than it was when I started doing it. So training is better organised, and you know, you occasionally at least you can get time off for training and support to to, to do that. Um, and. Um, I'm slightly anxious about somebody of my age um, giving advice to people of your age, but um, um, you know, if I if I had to do that, I I would say um, if it's something you want to do, um, you know, be determined, um, stick stick with it. Um, you know, it it is a it is a great uh, career. I, I try. I know that you've all heard this lots of times before. Um, and I'm I'm sorry to go on about one thing, but be careful about what you what you put on social media and so on, because that really does um, people really do do spot that. Um, get work experience if you can. Easier said than done. Uh, even in normal times at the minute, but especially at the moment, uh, a, a difficult thing to do. And again, I would say this, I suppose, but learn something about about leadership you know which tells you something about yourself something about teams um in medicine we get much better results as teams and teams are are very supportive and maybe we'll we'll come back to that and it also tells you something about the organization that you're working in so they they would be my tips and that's a quick run through um through my uh, career um I forgot to mention one thing that I put on there that I have I've become a playwright since I uh, retired. Not normally I get asked about that because it's a bit it's a bit different and so on. But I've avoided talking about that because that's not really what we're here for. But of course I can if you want me to. So I think that's me for the for the minute, Karen. Okay, thank you very much for that, Robert. That's really helpful and interesting, and I hope it's given. Um, you some ideas for some some questions and some things you might like to bring into the discussion okay so are you ready chris Shall uh yeah i'm ready um i've got some pictures so i'm just going to share my screen uh, so i can uh, I've kind of wrote so can you see that yeah good so uh, my name is chris johnson i'm um, a military consultant in anesthetics intensive care and pre-hospital emergency medicine so um, i'm pretty busy and i'm just going to show you some photos of, of sort of my experience of get, going to med school and then my career to date so far uh, with some hopefully some interesting things that you can do if you choose to study medicine uh, uh, anywhere but particularly at Newcastle. So um, again I'm from a non-medical family, nobody in my family has been a doctor, my mum was a nursery teacher, my dad's a dra draftsman, both now retired and I went to a comprehensive school in Rotherham um, which uh, wasn't particularly academic or illustrious. Uh, it was quite a, a big school with about 200 people in my year uh, and there was probably less than 10% of my year went to university. Um, I went to Thomas Rodman College to do my A-levels which was slightly more academic uh, and then I came to Newcastle University which at the time was called the University of Newcastle on time but they rebranded to a fancy new logo uh, a few years later. Um, 
So, and I graduated in 2006 uh, from Newcastle uh, and started my career and done most of my training in the Northeast uh, as well. And we'll go through a, a bit of that. So this was the medical school. It just opened this kind of fancy new front when I um, started. This is it relatively recently. It looks quite shiny and new still. Uh, and I just wanted to do a, a few things about what university life was like for me. So I joined the university rowing team, spent a lot of time um, in boats on rivers which was good uh, for kind of fitness and also some teamwork things as David alluded to very important. Uh, I found this photo which just amused me this is my mobile phone when I went to university it looks slightly different from mobile phones of, of now but um, uh, I was kind of looking for photos for this presentation and came across that and I thought it was quite good. Uh, university is absolutely fantastic a lot of parties get to go and do some amazing things. I, in between my first and second year of university, went uh, to Egypt with some of my mates and we bought a boat for like 50 quid and sailed it down the Nile for two weeks, uh, which was a fantastic time. There's a lot of fancy parties you can go to. There's a lot of um, fun you can have. So this is the Medics Review, a sort of variety show that we, that we do every year or did every year at Newcastle. Uh, the two gentlemen in the background who are more dressed are two of the lecturers who get involved and it's a great, kind of atmosphere at the end of term after exams uh, and there's a lots of you know medical themed events um, I have slightly more hair there than I do now uh, at the end of your towards the end of your um, medical school life you get to go on an elective so I went to work in Australia for six weeks with the uh, Sydney flying doctors and also in Africa um, and we'll come to why this has been pertinent for my ongoing career so this was a mission hospital when I was a medical student so I graduated from Newcastle, uh, my proud mum and dad, uh, and then went to work at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead, where I started my medical career. Uh, and then I've trained mostly in the North East, so through Health Education England, Health Education North East, and I trained, trained as an anaesthetist uh, and intensive care doctor, and I um, finished my training uh, three and a half years ago now, so I took a consultant post, um, up, remained in the North East there. So I now work as a consultant in the um, RVI, so the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle upon Tyne, that's connected to the medical school, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, and so most of my work's in intensive care, but I also do anaesthesia as well. Uh, and I do a kind of a bit of outreach stuff down to A&E. I found this nice, this is a picture of our therapy dog on intensive care who comes once a week to sit with all the patients, which is quite pleasant. But that's only uh, one of my jobs. Um, my second job is uh, with the military. So I'm a military um, consultant. So I spend most of my time in the NHS, but occasionally get taken out uh, of the NHS to go and do military things uh, in various parts of the world, usually in deserts. So um, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in Royal Army Medical Corps. Uh, and I spent much of my training going back and forth to Afghanistan to work in the hospital in Camp Bastion, which was um, both interesting and challenging in, in different ways and stuff that you don't see in the NHS, but it's definitely, definitely made me better as a, a NHS doctor. Uh, but it's not all going to deserts. I, I get to do some fun things. And back to David's point about leadership, this was my uh, training when I went to the Royal Mid Military Academy Sandhurst Commission uh, and just get second to none sort of leadership and teamwork training there. And we get to do some fun things as well. So this is um, a military research expedition, so medical research in Nepal. This was in 2016 and we spent a month trekking around the Himalayas doing altitude research and sort of medical things. So I spent a lot of time ultrasounding people's spleens uh, to see what, what happened to them at altitude, which was quite interesting. Uh, and my kind of third geeky bit for the military is I do a lot of CBRN medicine, so chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear medicine. So things in the news recently, you'll have seen the Novichok thing in Salisbury um, a, few, a couple of years ago now. That's kind of the area of military medicine that I'm most interested in. Um, and then you get to go and play in fields and run around for a bit, which is quite nice. Uh, so this is my yeah a thing we did for the military a while ago. So with my work uniform and my military uniform that they hashed together. Uh, my third job, so I work for the Great North Air Ambulance. That's the local air ambulance up here in the northeast and fly about for them. So we have a doctor paramedic team on every day. Uh, we have two aircraft, one in the northeast and one in the northwest. Um, and we get to go to things like this. Uh, so this is actually a training exercise, but this is kind of we go to big incidents so potentially car crashes or people who are very unwell in remote locations and bring intensive care or critical care 
forward of the hospital to bring, you know, improved patients' um, chance of surviving. So it's quite interesting. And also I get to fly around in a helicopter in the Northeast, which can be absolutely beautiful. So there's a fantastic photo I took the other week um, of just the bridges in Newcastle as we were leaving uh, the RVI, or actually arriving into the RVI um, to drop a patient off. Uh, and again, just some kind of interesting work that's just outside of normal hospital medicine. People kind of do um, hospital medicine can can get a bit um, repetitive, but this kind of keeps me interested because I have a relatively short attention span. Uh, I do some extra stuff uh, in addition to all those three things. I go and volunteer for um, an NGO in Africa. So I've kind of gone back to my what I did on my elective, partly Africa, partly flying in a helicopter. So I've worked a few times for a, an NGO called AMREF, so AMREF Flying Doctors. We go and do some outreach clinics and um, pick up sick patients from most of East Africa and take them back into um, to bigger hospitals in Nairobi and Tanzania mainly. Uh, and again, that's just something that's a bit more interesting. It kind of feels like you're giving something back to a community and it's quite challenging because it's quite different to working in the sort of developed world healthcare system. Um, so you do have to kind of think on your feet a little bit more. Uh, you get to meet some interesting people. So this was me and a Maasai warrior. Uh, last time I was there about two years ago. Uh, so I just go for kind of a month at a time and volunteer for, to help them. Um, so that's kind of a, a brief summary of my career. Obviously, I've still got um, a fair bit of time to do. I'm still relatively young. I've got another 20 years worth of NHS work to do. And hopefully I'll get to do some more interesting things in that time as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Chris. And we've heard about two quite contrasting careers in medicine there. Um, and um, it'd be interesting to hear what kind of questions that you have to ask people. Um, if you um, if you like, I can start off. I've got a couple of, of, of questions here that have already been put forward. Have there been many questions in the chat box, Jack and Emily? We haven't received any yet. Not yet. I won't. OK, start thinking, see if there's some, some questions you'd like to ask. But to kind of get the ball rolling, I'll start with these two questions you already have. And then hopefully you, you might like to add um, your questions and chat boxes for going along. But I have a question here from from Nazrin um, for Chris. Um, she asks, why did you choose to be an army doctor? Um, and what was the experience like? I think you've mentioned a little bit of that, but also um, um, there was an interest here. She asked about the difference between the camp and ordinary hospital. Yeah, so um, I chose to be an army doctor just because uh, I kind of wanted to challenge myself. So I, I, I'm acutely aware that I have a relatively short attention span and after a, a bit of time in doing the same thing, I need to be challenged. Otherwise I get a bit, a bit bored and my family tell me I get a bit annoying. Um, so I, I chose because I, I thought I wanted the challenge and you get some opportunities that you just don't get from working just in the NHS when that is going to work in areas such as war zones and um, things like um, natural disasters. We do a fair bit of kind of relief work for natural disasters. So uh, I that's the reason I joined. And then the, where the question was about the difference between Camp Bastion and uh, an NHS hospital. So yeah, that's massively different. So an NHS hospital caters for everything and everybody. Um, so you do literally everything from any from patients of any age, whereas the hospital in Camp Bastion was very good at doing one specific thing, which was treating people who'd been injured as a result of the, of the conflict. So it was quite narrow in terms of what we did. Um, and the team there was a lot smaller, so you knew everybody personally, whereas, you know, the hospital I work in, the trust I work in employs about 16,000 people, so there's no way you can know everybody. So it was kind of a different, smaller team. Um, so it was kind of a bit more personable, but probably harder work because you were working pretty much all the time. Uh, you didn't get any days off or anything while you were there. Very intensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I say something about that? Um, yes, please, don't worry. Um, I'm, I'm Chris is, um, is manfully poking fun at his own short attention span. But I think for, for anybody, you know, you could, in, in hospital medicine, you could be appointed to um, a consultant post and be in it for 25 or 30 years or, or even more. One of the great things about it is that you, you are able to do, you know, do these other things. And uh, even if you know if you're not a military person there are other jobs in the in the hospital and i'm sure you know i'm i'm certain the same is true in general practice and so on, where 
you know you can plug other jobs into it and so on and so forth that keep challenging challenging you and keep you fresh and so on and so forth and that's one of the good things about it plus mm -hmm. of course there is it is uh crucial to stay up up to date and so on and things progress so so rapidly so that's a great thing about the career i think is that you're continually being challenged and learning new things and as long as you're open to that you know that there's a lot of opportunities to keep you fascinated for a long long time Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think that's been really helpful from both of you because I think sometimes think well, you, you become a doctor and then you just stay in a hospital, but actually there's a world of opportunities out oh, there. That, like you say, yeah. that it's a long working life too, but it, it's it, if you have that level of opportunity, then that makes it, you know, so much more enjoyable. So that that's really good. I can see we're getting some questions in the chat box. That's great. I should also have said, sorry, I didn't mention before, that if you want to ask a question, just um, unmute yourself. And, and you can do that. So does anybody want to actually ask a question kind of live or would you like me to go back to the chat box? If anybody wants to ask a live question, please do. No, but if you don't want to, that's fine. You can you can do that later. Um, but I'll, I'll come and look at some of the ones in the chat box here because we've got some, some good things here to, to talk about too. Um, I think this question is aimed at Robert. Um, it's a question from Saffron who asks, what made you want to do surgery, Robert? Ah, well, um, I, I come from um, a family of people who are very mechanical and so on, and um, I, um, I'm, in, I'm interested in mechanical things. And um, so I, I, I liked what I thought was the, the logic of the specialty, you know, that it, I thought if I, um, if I learned what things should normally look like, and then I uh, saw so that something about anatomy and then I learned what they look like when when they're, they're not normal anymore. So that's pathology. And then I learned how to, you know, remove things and then put everything back together again, which is the surgery. They seem the logic in that. Um, so I like that aspect of it. Uh, and I, I'm uh, acutely aware that um, if you're doing an operation, you're doing an operation on a whole person and um, you have to look after the whole individual, not just the bit that you've operated on. Um, so that was a, you know, it's the second thing that the patients are, uh, can be um, challenging to look after if they're, if they're properly ill. Um, I like the immediacy of, um, of urgent care. Um, you know, if somebody comes in after a road traffic accident or something like that, um, and how much impact for the good that you can have under those situations. And then finally, I guess this, uh, this certainly applies to both of us. You get your best results as, as teams. Um, and I like the idea of, of working in a team and so on. So three or four different things really, but the thing that first attracted me to it was I could I could follow a sort of a logical progression through it no doubt that's the same in other specialties as well but but it was it was surgery that excited me and again um, I'm not I'm not sure if it tells you you know that it's been a good a good career and a good thing to do or if it tells you I'm a bit slow on the uptake but if I had my chance again I'd do the same thing again I think mm. That's always a good advice. It's always nice to hear people say that, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question from um, Eloise, and she's asking, how did you become an army doctor, Chris? How did you do that? Uh, yes, so um, you can join, um, well, so there's cadetships you can join to go through university. I actually joined after I'd graduated. Uh, so if you are interested in that, then it's it is a pretty straightforward book very competitive and um, certainly more competitive now than it used to be way of doing it so if you go on the army jobs website you can search for is a medical cadetship uh, and they um, if you do that for university you can get funded or um, paid to go um, but then you have a return of service you have to serve for so long afterwards and um, so if you want I'm, you know, I'm not up to date on how it all works so go on the army jobs website and you'll get a bit more information And then another question we have in the box is from Catherine. 
and she asks, um, I think this question is also for you, Chris, um, did you have to complete any extra training to work with the Army or Air Ambulance? Uh, yeah, both. So um, the Army, you have to do military training uh, and then there's extra medical training you have to do, which kind of complements your, your normal medical training. So it just kind of adds extra courses and skills on, but are specific to the things that you like to see in the Army. Uh, from the Air Ambulance point of view, uh, so there's now a national training program for it so you can get a, um, a what we call a cct so a certificate of completion of training so when you finish your training you get one of these certificates and that means you can be a consultant uh, and that exists now for for, pre, for pre-hospital emergency medicine so as a senior trainee from either anesthetics intensive care or emergency medicine you can add that on uh, to do in addition to your to your base specialty so that involves an extra year of training uh, to the normal training program. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question, I think, is also for you, Chris. Um, Shreya asks, "How did you come across your CBRN research opportunities?" Um, so quite that's niche, doesn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. quite. It is quite niche. Mm-hmm. So that's um, f- through the through the army. So. Uh, the, one of the courses potentially you have to do is a, a CBRN medical course, so to train you how to, to look after people if they've been um, subject to one of these kind of weapons or if they've, if they've had sort of it's more toxicology than, than weapons in the UK. Um, and that's done uh, down near the, the Defence Science and Technology Lab, so Port and Down. Uh, so I went on that course as part of the training that I had to do, and then I um, started instructing on that course and just kind of got involved with it um, that way. And there's, there's plenty of research opportunities in that area, especially currently. Fascinating, I think. Yeah, very good. Um, I think we've got a question here for Robert. Um, Saffron asks, did you prefer being a surgeon or a medical director? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a good question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, I would say, without, without doubt, prob- probably surgery. To be, to be honest with you, be, being medical director is pretty much a, a sort of um, managerial role, and you have responsibility for a lot of things. I did it because um, I thought if you could do it, if you could do it well, and it is a challenge, then. Um, you get a chance to influence uh, for the better the care of uh, more patients than you would as an individual surgeon. Um, but but um, you know no, a number of things um, crop up that you that you don't expect to crop up and so on, which I won't go into at the minute. Um, it, one of the really good things about being medical director is that um, it. It's very varied and you hardly ever um, end up doing the stuff that's in your diary for the day. And quite often I'd have days where, you know, I was I was organized for whatever was in the diary for the whole day, uh, only to find I didn't get around to doing any of it because some crisis or other had occurred and needed to be dealt with straight away. Um, but surgery is obviously more of an immediate thing. And I guess the, the easiest way for me to answer that question is if, if, I, if I look back on, say, highs and lows of, of my career so far, then uh, uh, most of the highs, if not all of the highs, are from surgical practice, I would, I would say. So, yeah. Once a surgeon, always a surgeon, I think. I was expecting if we'd been in the same room, Chris would have thrown something at me. Or something. <laughs> well, what a good job we're on Zoom. I couldn't know that we could really manage that very well. No banter between anaesthetist and surgeon would have come. Ah, all right, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's an in- interesting professional dynamic then, is it? <laughs> right, we've got a question now from um, Tadi. Tadi, I hope I've said your name correctly. Um, and they ask here is in your experience, I think this must be Chris, because I don't think did you work at RVI, Robert? Or uh, only in training. Only okay. in well, training. I guess it for either of you. The question is, in your experience, how does working at RVI differ from working in other hospitals? Um, I mean it, it 
kind of does in small ways, but it doesn't really. Most NHS hospitals are, are run in the same way and they all have the same sort of base specialties. So they all have, you know, an emergency, well, mostly have an emergency department, a sort of medical um, department, a surgical department, an orthopedic. So the, the only thing that's really different about the bigger hospitals is that there's more specialties. So sort of subspecialties or tertiary referral specialties so things that are either less common or so specialized that they aren't in every hospital so the rvi has some things like neurosurgery um so which only occur in the northeast only have it at the rvi or james cook down in middlesbrough none of the other hospitals um so that's the only real difference um and it's just a, a bigger organization so it's slightly more impersonal because you don't know everybody but you still get to know you know the people you work around and then this kind of small teams you interact with Um, the next question is an interesting one from, and again, forgive me if I'm making any errors in pronunciation, but it's um, Mogtaseed. Um, and um, the question is saying, what does medical leadership entail? That's a very really good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, I, I mean, I guess the, the, um, the best answer to that is every, everybody, and especially in... <laughs> every, Everybody in um, in medicine and in most other walks of life are, are leaders and followers. There are times when you have to lead people and times when you have to follow people. And some of it's about, um, about some of the studies are about what, what make you a good leader or why you would want to, why anyone would want to follow you and so on and so forth. What it really entails, I guess, is, is three things. Uh, it, it tells you something about yourself and I'm sure you've either done or at least know about personality types and so on so what that tells you is why you react to a particular situation in a particular way and why other people react that way so it helps you understand you know how, how you get on with people and how they get on on with you and so on so that's the first thing the second thing is on a slightly bigger level is how do teams interact and how do they work together and um, you know I, I referred my introduction to the fact that in medicine uh, there's good scientific evidence showing that we get better results as a team and um, there are good studies from Aston University in Birmingham showing that if uh, organizations have high um, measures of teamwork and so on and the ways that you can do that they get better results for their patients so there's a statistically significant improvement in uh, mortality rate and so on and so forth if if the organizations work in teams and then the third thing so that's something about individuals something about teams and the third level is something about organizations which tells you something about you know you we've already learned what how we tick and how our team ticks but how does the organization tick and in in particular uh for a long-term job like a consultant job is that the sort of place that we want to be working in for the next 25 years or or whatever you know so in in brief that's it um i, I could go on but i suspect i probably have done enough already thank you Thanks, Robert. Did you want to add anything to that, Chris? Uh, yeah, so I get uh, quite, asked quite a lot about leadership generally, less about medical leadership. And I always hark back to um, leadership in, in the military. So you get drummed this into you as uh, you go, if you join the army, you join, go to the Royal Military, military Academy at Sandhurst. And that's like where you get leadership training that you get nowhere else in the world. And it, it, every time somebody mentions the word I think back to a specific lecture which was by the commandant who gave us this lecture and it's probably the most enthralling lecture I've ever been in it was just captivating um so leadership the word itself comes from um the royal navy in the 17th century uh, it specifically means the ship with the strongest bows that breaks the ice to let all the other ships follow so I always kind of hark back to that if you are a leader you've got to break a bit of ice um, so you've got to get people safely from one place to another and you can't do that sometimes without breaking ice. And then there's a, a few kind of stock phrases that came out of this lecture and one of them's um, think to the finish. So think about the consequences of your actions now and how that's going to affect you and everybody else in the future. 
Uh, the other one was do as you ought, not as you want. And that kind of is a, a bit of a military ethos of, of the standard you walk past as the standard you accept. So make sure you've got your own high standards and you bring up everybody else's. And, and the last was, um, which goes to David's of, of teamwork, is all of one company. So you're all on the same team in the NHS. All everybody's working for is the patient that's in front of you or the patients that you're looking after. And if you all think about um, you're all on the same team trying to do for the best of that patient, uh, then you won't go far wrong. Thanks. That's really helpful. Thank you to both of you for that. And um, we've still got a couple more questions, so we'll, we'll keep going with those. We've got um, a question from Shreya who says that if you're considering a career in medical research, would it be worth looking at summer internships at research institutes? Um, I don't know which of you can. So I don't have a lot of research experience. So um, do you, if, if Robert does, then that might be a better. Um, yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I've done a reasonable amount of research. Um, that was one of, one of the things I sort of referred to before, you know, about doing other, other things alongside your, your consultant job and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, norm, normally, um, I think you probably need to focus mainly on, on getting into medicine, first of all, um, bef you know, before... Um, before focusing on the research and so on. If you want to, you know, if you want to be a medical research person, you want to be a medically qualified research person. Um, so um, there'll be plenty of opportunities later on because, um, you know, there are always uh, little studies coming up really right from the time that you qualify. In fact, uh, to be honest, the first bit of research I got involved with myself was uh, when I was a third year medical student, so pretty early on. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to, to do that. Um, so I would say the main thing would be to focus on, you know, getting into the getting into medical school and um, and and seeing how the course goes to start with. Um, but all bits of work experience are are useful and and will be talked about at interviews and so on and so forth i would think so i w i wouldn 't say no to to anything but i wouldn 't necessarily put it at the top of my list at, at the moment and um, because we 've got one more question and um, come through from saffron yes, uh, any, any tips for any going tips? into surgery yeah. is a question your top tips okay um uh, to be honest, uh, Saffron, to, um, although I, um, I said, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do surgery early on, um, I, I think um, what I'd be saying at the moment at your stage is keep an open mind because there's a whole load of um, options available to you. Um, surgery is one of those things you're going to have to do, you know both as a student and uh, in the early days of uh, after you've qualified and so on so um, I you know I, I, would I would caution against making your mind up too soon as to what specialty you want to do because as you go through you might find that um, you know other things appeal or, or might you know suit whatever lifestyle you decide you want and so on and so forth um for those people doing surgery there's a traditional sort of uh you know way of doing it which is um you know to um when qualified um some people will go off and teach anatomy and so on for for a year um because it makes it makes it much easier to to understand and to get through the exams and so on and so forth. And there's a sort of traditional route that way. Um, but um, again, I, I think uh, for the moment, keeping an open mind is probably the best, probably the best way forward. Um, apart from that, I, you know, the, the best way to learn surgery in my opinion is, is to be attached to people who are you know who are um, good surgeons and who are technically um, good and there are plenty of those around around the region. Um, so 
you know, uh, that that would be my advice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. It's from Taddy. How much flexibility is there available when switching between specialities or having multiple jobs as a medical professional? Chris, um, medical, not multiple so job man, you can have multiple that. Multiple jobs is, is reasonably flexible, but quite time consuming. The, the switching between specialties, so I'm sure you've um, looked into the way medical careers work. So graduate from medical school, you do foundation training, which is two years, and then you tend to pick a, a specialty. Now, depending on then if you do that for a while and as a sort of senior house officer or core trainee, as it's called now, uh, and then decide you want to switch, it depends what you want to switch into. Some things are a bit transferable, but generally you would have to start again, probably back at the beginning of that specialty training program. So say, for example, you decided you wanted to um, train to be a radiologist and you do two years of radiology training and then you've done it and you think, actually, I want to be a surgeon. I want some more hands on. You'd have to go back to the beginning and start the surgical training program from the start. So it, the, the years you, although have gained experience, probably wouldn't count. Um, if you do something that's a bit more akin to each other, so things like uh, A&E or accident and emergency medicine and acute medicine, then there's, you might get a year or so transferred across to reduce your training time. So you can change. Um, you don't have to pick uh, straight away. You can try a few things, but it's, you might have to do slightly longer in training, which is not a bad thing. Uh, and then... The flexibility is, you know, you've got to build that into your life. And um, I have a diary that plans my life and it gets filled up months in advance um, to, to do stuff. So as long as you're organised, you can you can do anything you want. Organisation is the key. Yeah, that it is. OK. So can I, can I say something about that, Karen? Yes, sorry, I beg your pardon, Robert. Please do. Um, yes. It's probably easier for me to say this than it is for Chris. But people, mm. people who do two jobs or three jobs in his case, um end up with um you know with a massive uh a, a workload because um in each of those three places everybody thinks they're full time in their in their bit um so um multiple jobs um is a is a good thing as we've both said throughout the the last hour and so on but you have to um you have to try to manage it if you can um and uh that, that can that can be easier easier said than done. Um, switching specialties, I can't really add much to what what Chris said. Um, having said which, of course, you'll be a student for five years, and then you've got a couple of years after that, so you've got a good chance to to look at all the specialties or all the main specialties anyway. But even after all that time, of course, you won't have done everything. But uh, there will be opportunities for flexible time, you know, where you can go and, go and do other things and so on. So you should yeah, be able to get a, a good you look. You do get some time in medical school to try most things. And then in a foundation program, it's fairly broad, but you yeah. can kind of make some vague choices, especially for the second year about um, if you want to try something out. And even if you don't get a rotation in that, so you can do taste a week. So you can take a week out to go and, and work in a specialty um, to see if it's something that you would like to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's very reassuring that you don't have to make a choice early on. I think that you have that flexibility to explore during training and then, like you've both said, sort of later on too. So, yeah, that's, that's quite nice for people to hear. So down to the final part, really, of, of, of the session, uh, I'm going to ask each of our um, guests in turn the same question. Um, I'll start with you, Robert, if that's OK. Um, and the question is, considering your time at university and your own career, which one bit of advice would you like to share with partner students? Right, well, I'm, I'm not going to be one of those annoying people who then says three or four different things, although I could. Um, I get, which means it's got to be a very broad thing, I guess, if it's one piece of advice. So um, my, my um, bit of advice would be um, never let your curiosity uh, go unanswered. Um, in other words, Medicine's a massive uh, field. Every single day you find, you'll hear about things that you don't know about. Um, hopefully not, not in your field, but in other parts of the hospital. But then, um, as I say, um, the, you know, patients come with a 
sometimes the multitude of, of issues and so on and so forth. So there's a huge amount to be learned and a huge amount to be fascinated by. So I would say whenever something happens you don't know about, it doesn't matter if it's in medicine or, or not, go away and find out about it, look it up. Um, it's very educational, it keeps you, you know, keeps you interested and uh, keeps you fascinated because it's a it's you know what we're what we're doing as doctors is a real privilege and, and needs to be viewed as as that by us thank you very much robert so it's sort of it's all about learning you never stop learning i think is yeah, what I'm hearing that's you right. lifelong is... learning not yeah. as i'm discovering now not even career-long learning it's <laughs> after that too okay that's really helpful thank you um, how about how about yeah? Would you like me to repeat the question, Chris? Uh, no, I think I think mine okay. would be to um, try just try new things. Don't be afraid to to try new things, especially when you go to university. There's you you know there's so many opportunities, and you never know where these things are going to lead. So, if if you've got even the vaguest interest in something, go and try it out because you, if you don't know if you've not tried it, you don't know if you'll like it. Uh, and even, even if that doesn't turn out, whatever it is to be the thing you want to do, you've you've tried and it might lead on to something else. You might meet somebody who gets you into something else. So um, just, you know, keep your horizons broad and, and try things. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to say a great big thank you to Robert and Chris for, for spending time with us this afternoon. And hopefully the kinds of things that they've been telling you about, the sort of questions that you've asked and, and the information being given has helped you um, and hopefully inspired you to um, to go ahead with your, your medical plans if, if that's what you're planning to do. And if you do that, we'd obviously be very, very, very happy to welcome you all to Newcastle University. Thank you for tuning in to this recording of the Partners 2020 Ask the Expert session. We hope you found the discussion and the presentations from our guests useful and insightful. Remember to stay up to date with further advice from alumni and industry professionals. Subscribe to our Newcastle University Career Service YouTube channel and you can follow us on our social media channels at NCL Careers on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We hope to see you in September. Good luck and take care.